Hey, good morning everybody. My name is Liam Duran. Welcome to B&H Optic. Uh, I'm out here right now getting, uh, well, looking for some moose. I haven't found any this morning, but you know, that's all right. Sometimes it's all about the, uh, about just about being out here really. Um, you know, when I first got into wildlife photography, I was really intimidated by it. I thought that I needed to go to super exotic locations and that I had to spend a ton of money on huge wildlife you know oriented lenses to get good shots uh, but over the next half an hour or so i'm going to tell you guys that that's not exactly true it's easier than you think and it's less expensive so what we're going to do is talk about photographing some of north america's largest land mammals including bison elk bighorn sheep mountain goats bears and of course moose if i didn't say that already anyhow um I'm going to give you guys some tips and tricks for how to get your sharpest, best photos ever of these beautiful animals. Uh, we're going to talk about some location ideas, whether you're on the east coast, the west coast, or the middle of the country, where you can find some of these animals. Uh, and of course, we're going to talk about gear too. So stay tuned. We're going to go over all that stuff. We're actually going to go back into the office um, where I'll show you guys some slides and some photos of exactly what I'm talking about. So let me pack it up here. We'll head back to the office and do that and, uh, and get started. Here we go. Okay, uh, here we are back in the office. And uh, here we go, of moose and mountain goats. Getting great wildlife photos is e easier than you think, and it really is. So real quick again, I know I mentioned this earlier, but my name is Liam Duran. I'm a Sigma ambassador here for B&H Optic. Um, and what do I shoot? So primarily I shoot, well, I'm an outdoor photographer, so I shoot a ton of, well, everything outdoors. I do a lot of action sports. That's, that's kind of the meat of my work. So a lot of skiing, mountain biking, backpacking, hiking, trail running, all that sort of stuff. Um, but I also shoot a lot of uh, landscapes and I shoot what we're going to discuss today, uh, wildlife. So today we're going to be talking about, you know, some of the ethics of wildlife photography, some techniques, some locations, and of course we're going to be talking a little bit about gear. The first thing I want to talk about is don't, <laughs> is to not be intimidated. And I know that when I first started in wildlife photography, I was very much so intimidated by the genre. Um, first of all, I thought that I had to go to these amazing places that would cost a ton of money to get to, right? I thought I had to go to Africa or India or, you know, up into the Alaskan bush to get amazing wildlife photos. And that just is not true. I also thought that I was going to have to spend a ton of money on lenses uh, to get great wildlife photo. And that is also not true anymore. I also thought it would take a ton of time to get what I wanted, and that also turned out to be false. So um, remember, you know, for all this wildlife photography, the most important part is having fun and connecting with the world around you. So let's take it from that perspective. First off, and this is really, really important, you guys, is that it's all about the animals. The safety of the animals and people is paramount here. So you need to follow all the rules and regu regulations of wherever it is that you are out photographing. Uh, keep your distance from wild animals. Never, ever feed or approach wild animals. Even you know, even the smaller ones like bighorn sheep or mountain goats can be dangerous at times. So please just keep your distance. Um, and failure to comply with these rules can be disastrous for everyone, for both the animals and for people. So please uh, remember animals first, wildlife photos second. Okay, so first off, the thing I want to talk about is when you're out photographing your animals, uh, be it, you know, and again today... Just to kind of to, to rehash what we're talking about, we're talking about large North American wildlife. So moose, mountain goats, bighorn sheep, uh, bears, uh, bison, elk, uh, those are the animals that we're talking about. And when you decide you are going to go out and photograph them, the first thing you're going to want to do is research their behavior, research the animals and their behavior and know um, a bit about them so that you can get your best shots possible. For example, this photo here of this magnificent 
Uh, Mountain Goat, I, you know, he looks like he's been at the spa essentially and is all freshly brushed and combed out. Um, and that's be, and I was able to get this shot of his coat looking like this because I knew that in very late August and early winter, their fresh coats are in. And at the same time, there's not quite enough snow to keep me from getting up the mountain to photograph them. So using uh, a bit of knowledge about when their coats come in and also knowing that there wasn't too much snow allowed me to get this shot. Um, same with this moose here. I love photographing the moose in late fall, or sorry, <laughs> late summer, early fall as the, uh, as the velvet is just coming off of their antlers. So I usually, almost every summer for the last couple of years, I try to get out and find the moose as the velvet is peeling off their antlers. Um, so again, just knowing that this little two to three week time period exists is, is really crucial to getting this shot. You might get lucky and get a shot like this, but if you can plan it, then even better. So, Elk. I love photographing elk. Uh, you know, and when you've, you know, in the spring when they first kind of, uh, when you're first out shooting some wildlife, the the elk are not particularly uh, photogenic that time of year. You know, they're kind of scrawny. They look like they just woke up from a long nap, which essentially they did. They just basically have been surviving the last few months, um, and they're and they're not that great. But in the fall, they really, really uh, are beautiful to photograph. So. You know, the rut is an amazing time of year to be out looking for elk uh, and capturing, capturing them really just doing what they do, which is to, uh, well, they're in the rut. So they're basically looking to uh, make the next generation of elk. And you just get to see them doing their thing like they've done for a thousand years. And it's really, really cool. Um, you know, light, of course, is just like any genre of photography, light is really important, right? So, you know, it's really challenging with wildlife because we can't control where the wildlife is going to be. Uh, we can't set them up in the exact situations that is going to, to give us our best shots. But if we, we can set ourselves up for success by being out very early in the morning and very late in the day. Um, this gives us two things. One, um, that's when the animals are most active, especially this time of year in June. You know, it gets hot in the middle of the day. So that's when they're most active. And going back to the light, that is when the, uh, the light is going to be the best. You know, this photo here looks very similar to the last one of the bison. This is a, a moose in a little pond. And, uh, but it's, it's actually completely different. What I've done here is I have used some foreground elements, some aspen leaves that were kind of orange and backlit, and I basically put them in front of the moose, but then let them go out of focus and focused in on the moose itself. So it creates this orange glow. And, you know, framing, of, of course, is really important, too. And I use a lot of natural elements. I do this in my action sports photography as well. But I frame, I like to frame my wildlife with some natural elements. And it really, what it does is it, it hope, like, essentially gets your viewer's eye zoned right into the animal and focuses right in on the animal. But, and I like doing it, you know, you have this cool green look on the left side of the frame here and a little bit of out of focus brush on the right. Um, and it just, it's just a nice way to, to frame your, uh, your animals. Okay. So, you know, it's all about the eyes, right? You really want to be sure that you focus on the eyes of the animal because that's where the connection lies. And if you've done any research on wildlife photography, I'm sure you've heard this before, but it's really important. And learning how to use your camera's autofocus system to get you, to enable you to focus on that eye is also going to be really important. You know, today's modern cameras have amazing uh, eye detect, animal eye detect features that will just follow essentially uh, your animal's eyes. And it's really incredible. You know, when I flip to this, an image like this, it's the first thing you look at. It's the first thing your eyes go to. Well, maybe it was the horns, but hopefully it was the eye. Um, so it's a really, really important concept to, to focus in on those eyes. 
Now, as much as I love a really nice, good, tight headshot of an animal, almost a portrait, if you will, I also really like to pull it back a little bit. And it's really, I think it's really important to pull back. And, uh, and, and the main reason being that you can show the animal in their element in their natural habitat like we have the mountain goat here with the mountain you know the big mountains in the background it's good to pull back and show the entire scene you know here it is again this is just early morning uh you know i'm actually shooting at 600 millimeters here but i personally am very far away from this herd of elk um, so, so two ways you can do it. You can shoot a little bit with, uh, sorry, shoot with a wider lens or you yourself can be stepped back, but showing, showing the entire scene, I think is really important, you know, and, and speaking of natural settings, let's go back outside for a little bit. And I'm going to show you a couple of the, uh, the lenses and, uh, you know, and the gear that I'm using to get some of these shots. So let's pause here and we'll step back outside and we'll come back in in a few minutes. Oh man, too cool. Here I am getting ready to give you guys a lowdown on gear and what walks out of the brush. <laughs> All right, so now we're back out in our natural element. Um, so I wanted to go over a couple of the pieces of gear that you've seen in the slideshow. Every photo you've seen so far was taken with uh, the lenses I'm about to show you here. So. Uh, first off, I want to start with the 150-600S, and the reason I want to start with this one is that it was a really important lens for me and probably for a lot of people. Um, you have to consider that only a few years ago, five or six years ago, the only way you were getting really going to get a 600 millimeter lens was to spend thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars. So when this lens came out, it's a 150-600. Um, you know, for, I don't even, I think it's around $2,200, $2,300. Um, it really put wildlife photography in the reach of everybody. Um, so that's why I want to start with this first. And this is my first wildlife photo lens as well. Um, and I still use it to this day. It's weather sealed. It's fairly small compared to a 600 prime lens. It's fairly small, fairly light, and, uh, and it works awesome. You know, I do use it with the MC11 on the Sony cameras, but doesn't really seem to matter. It doesn't hold it back in any way, shape, or form. I'm getting great photos out of this. So that's why I want to start with this one first. Okay, the second lens I want to talk about was the 7200. And this is kind of like where everyone starts. A lot of people have a 7200 lens. So you'll take it out to do a little bit of wildlife, but you generally will quickly find that your 7200 is a little short for most wildlife applications. Now, don't get me wrong, when I go to any of the national parks and when I'm out and about shooting wildlife, I do have this lens with me. And the reason is that sometimes I want to shoot a little bit wider. If I want to capture the animal in their natural setting, this is a really good way to do that. I can pull back a little bit and, you know, all the way out at 70 millimeters and that is you know pretty helpful for showing the animal uh, in their habitat okay the next lens that i want to talk about a little bit is the 100 400 uh, this is the dgdn version so it is mounted right on my sony camera right here uh, the sigma 100 400 is awesome it's very light it's very sharp uh, and i use this a ton so if I'm going to be hiking up the side of a mountain, if I'm going on a multi-day backcountry trip, this is the lens that will typically find its way in my pack just because it is so light and so portable, uh, but you're also not really sacrificing anything either. It's, it's brilliantly sharp, as you've seen in some of the photos that we've gone over so far. So yeah, this is a real winner for me. I absolutely love this lens. Okay, the last lens I want to talk about uh, with you guys is the Sigma 500 f4. And I've just recently started using this lens, uh, and it is awesome. Um, it's actually pretty light for a giant uh, prime lens, 500 f4, and, uh, and it's brilliantly sharp. Um, and I just, I, I just am really enjoying shooting with this. You know, the reason that you would shoot with a, a constant at like a constant F4 aperture versus, you know, the 150-600, which is a variable aperture, is that wide F4 
gives you really good separation between your foreground and your background and your subject. So if you're shooting wide open at f4, it really concentrates uh, your viewer's eyes right on the animal. So that's, a, that's one of the main reasons uh, that I like to shoot this one is to, is to really isolate the subject. All right, so for a backpack, the main one I'm using is this, uh, the Mindshift or Think Tank, the Backlight Elite 45 liter. Um, I really like this pack a lot. It's got tons of room for all my gear, but even more importantly, uh, it has room for, uh, for everything else that I need on a shoot. You know, back in the day, camera packs used to carry cameras, but there was never any space for, you know, your extra layers, um, food and water, uh, you know, when I'm backcountry skiing and doing those kind of shoots, there's a ton more gear that needs to get in the pack. And this one handles it all super well. So it protects it. It keeps it safe. It carries very well. It's my go-to pack. It's awesome. And for just about all my shoots, uh, all my wildlife photo shoots, I do have a tripod with me. In fact, I usually have two tripods with me. This is my uh, bigger, heavier one. And it is carbon fiber, three section. I really like this tripod quite a bit. Um, you know, a lot of wildlife photographers will be using a gimbal head and that's probably a better idea. And maybe one of these days I'll get a gimbal head too. Um, but for now, you know, I can just load up my big lens right here and then I have a tensioner knob. So it's not just going to flop over when I open it up. It's still pretty, pretty tight. Uh, so this works fairly well. It's not the perfect solution for a wildlife photographer. Uh, but if you don't feel like, you know, if you've already spent enough money on your setup and you don't want to spend another couple hundred bucks on your gimbal, you don't necessarily have to. If you have a good ball head, it will work. Um, yeah, so uh, I do use the tripod beat just because, you know, the, the lenses are big, they are heavy, and I don't want to hold it, hand hold it all day. And using the tripod also makes, you know, or ensures, I should say, that you're getting your sharpest shots possible. So use a tripod. Okay, well that's about it for gear. Um, let's head back into the office and we'll go through just a couple more slides, a couple more photos, some tips and tricks, some locations, a couple other things. And uh, yeah, so let's do that. Let's wrap it up now and head back there. Okay, well how cool was that? As we're getting ready to uh, getting ready and set up to go over all the gear, the moose comes right out of the bush. That was That was pretty special. Thank you. For that, Mr. Moose. Anyhow, um, so just to reiterate the gear list, this, this is my most commonly used gear, the Sigma 150 600S, the Sigma 100 400 DGDN, uh, contemporary actually, that's a, a misprint there, it shouldn't be an S lens, uh, and the Sigma 500 F4S. And the camera body that I'm most using nowadays is the Sony A9 II, and my backup body is the Sony A7 III. Of course, I'm always using these on a tripod or most of the time I'm use, using them on a tripod and I'm using the Think Tank uh, Backlight Elite 45L to carry it all in. So I want to go over some locations real quick because I think this is really important. Um, if you want to see elk and moose in the fall, I would absolutely head to Rocky Mountain National Park. It is one of the best places to photograph moose and elk. You can also get bighorn sheep there in the spring, summer, and fall. Uh, but the elk really is is uh, what I go there for. Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming is an awesome place. Oh, and I should point out here that every photo you've seen has been in one of these four places. So uh, these four places uh, have really delivered to me over the years, for me over the years. Um, anyhow, Grand Teton National Park, grizzly bears in the spring is just an amazing time to be there. And then in the fall, the moose and elk are just fantastic to photograph there. And bison are going to be there year round and are wonderful to photograph year round. Zion National Park is a great spot for shooting desert bighorn. And my hometown, Breckenridge, Colorado, uh, is where I can get tons of photographs of moose year round and mountain goats year round. Um, and there's some other great mountain towns too, you know, Winter Park and Steamboat also have great populations of all these animals as well. You know, if you're on the East Coast, uh, you can get phenomenal elk shots in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And that's probably just a, you know, half day or day's drive for a lot of people that are up in the, you know, New York City area. Uh, if you're on the West Coast, Point Reyes National Seashore is an awesome spot. And so uh, are the Redwoods National Park and Olympic National Park. Both have herds of the Roosevelt elk. 
Um, for moose, you could go north from New York City into Baxter State Park. And for those of us living more uh, in the upper Midwest, Isle Royale National Park has a big population of moose as well. For mountain goats, again, here in Breckenridge is a great spot to shoot them, but Glacier National Park is an amazing spot for mountain goats. And uh, for those in the front range uh, of Colorado, just right up Mount Evans Road in, in, uh, in Colorado is a great, great spot to, uh, to basically, you can photograph mountain goats from the car. Uh, bighorn sheep, uh, they are scattered around Colorado. They're a little harder to find. Uh, Taos, New Mexico is where I've gotten some great photos of the bighorns. Grand Canyon National Park is also a really good spot to, to see the bighorn sheep. And uh, again, in the front range of Colorado, Garden of the Gods, Colorado. And by no means is this an extensive list. I'm just giving you some really good ideas. Any of these places I've mentioned, if you show up, you will photograph these animals for sure. Okay, let's set up our cameras for success. First off, you want to be shooting in RAW. Um, I, it just gives you far more latitude in your post-processing. Um, so I, I shoot everything in RAW, and I'll, just about everyone I know is shooting in RAW. Uh, for total control of your image, I suggest you shoot in a full manual. There are certain, certainly times where people, well, <laughs> excuse me, uh, when uh, wildlife photographers will use either aperture priority uh, or maybe even um, uh, shutter priority or even ISO, uh, let the ISO kind of float around to get the best exposure. But in general, I'm shooting and most people are shooting in full manual because it gives you the most control of your image. Uh, shoot in servo or continuous autofocus. And um, that's really important. Your animals are moving around quite a bit. And if you're shooting in servo, it will track the animal as he moves back and forth through the frame. And it's really important to, that you uh, spend some time learning how to best set up and use your autofocus system. Another good thing to do is use your fastest frame rate. That way when the animal is moving, um, you're getting 20, whatever it is, 10, 15, 20 frames per second. And then when you go back and edit your photos, you can pick the best frame of them. Use a tripod. These lenses are pretty big and pretty heavy, or at least they are compared to, say, a 2470 lens. Um, there are two types of movement, right, that can ruin or keep your shot from being sharp. One is camera movement, and your camera is moving around, and that will, you know, keep your image from being sharp. The other is subject motion. So if you keep your your lens on a tripod and camera on a tripod, uh, that just at least eliminates the camera movement. Uh, also be sure to turn off your optical stabilizer when your camera and lens are on the tripod. Use fast shutter speeds. This is also really important. Like I just said, you know, if you, if you do, if you have your camera on a tripod, you've at least eliminated that uh, risk for soft photos. Uh, you know your camera's not going to be bouncing around all over the place. And by using a fast shutter speed, your subjects will be frozen in time as well. And that will keep them nice and sharp. So fast shutter speeds. Be prepared. Keep that lens and camera handy. If you're driving down the road and you happen to spot a small grizzly bear cub climbing a tree and your camera is stuffed in its pack and put away, uh, the action's probably going to be over before you get to, to take the shot. So, uh, and this happened right here. I was driving down the road. I saw this scene. My camera's sitting right next to me in the car. I roll down the window and I'm able to squeeze off a quick frame and get the shot. Okay, so anyhow, let's head back outside for some final thoughts here. And uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's get back outside and uh, we'll see you out there in a minute. All right, back outside again in the wind. So it is a little breezy, so it might be a little hard to hear. Hopefully the audio is okay. But, uh, but yeah, um, you know, big game wildlife photography is challenging, but it's super fun. And I hope with this uh, short presentation that I have at least inspired you guys with some locations and some tips and tricks and of course some gear ideas to get you guys out on your own wildlife uh, photo adventure. Um, you know, it's just a great way to explore and learn about the natural world around us and that's one of the main reasons that I do it. So, few key takeaways that I want you guys to remember today. 
Uh, one, it's all about the animals. Please, please be sure to follow all rules and regulations. Never feed them, never bait them in any way, shape, or form. Um, animals come first, photos a uh, distant second. Second, you don't need to spend a ton of money traveling to exotic locations and buying super expensive gear. You can stay relatively close to home or even with just a little bit of travel, get to some phenomenal locations and photograph some of the most beautiful animals in North America. And of course, you don't need to spend 10, 11, $12,000 on a long telephoto lens. As I've shown you, there's great options from Sigma at a fraction of the cost that will get you all the quality and all the reach that you need for awesome wildlife photography. Three, for tack sharp photos, be sure to use very high shutter speeds and also put your camera and lens on a tripod. And when you are on a tripod, be sure to turn your optical stabilizer off. Also, when animals are moving around a bunch, be sure to be in AI servo mode so that you can track the animal as it moves around in the wilderness. Okay, four, get out early and stay out late. That's when the animals are gonna be most active and that's when the light is going to be the best. Five, uh, remember, this is fun. You shouldn't put any stress on yourself about results. Uh, it's all about the journey. It's about learning uh, all about the wildlife that we're photographing and learning about the environments that they live in. So let's just have fun uh, with our wildlife photography and not concentrate too much on the results. Anyhow, I want to have uh, a give a big shout out to B and H for uh, having me, and of course to Sigma for sponsoring this and sponsoring me to be here for you guys. Um, it's been a blast. And uh, what else? Oh, in just a few minutes, I'll be live to answer any questions that you might have regarding any of the stuff we've talked about today. So stay tuned and here we go.